All right, um, grid search. Uh, today, how I want to do this is I want to cover the bare minimum of what we're going to do, like the core functions here. And then I want to do a bit of a live coding uh, just to kind of uh, walk you through how I hunt down hyperparameters using a grid search. Um, I've watched two previous cohorts videos and cohort two did a pretty cool um, unsupervised uh, how do you use grid search in an unsupervised way? So they did a little time series with stock prices, um, but I'm gonna take it a little simple and use a sample data set from Slice Competition last week. And yeah, just go about how I uh, hunted down those hyperparameters. Okay, so Daniel covered the hyperparameters yesterday, or sorry, last week, and we're pretty familiar with these functions, right? Dials package and the tune package. Um, once you, so the parameters calls you the parameters from a model spec, and you can use a grid regular function from the dials package to create a grid that you want to, it's basically a combination of hyperparameters that you want to tune. And there's also a random grid, which the book doesn't cover too, too much. And there's a tune grid function from a tune package to actually conduct the search. And we can use a bunch of uh, helper functions to um, extract information out of them, like a select best model, or even like a collect uh, metrics, or and so on. And then the book goes on to talk about a little more uh, technical things, like sub sub model optimization, how the parallel processing works in the model uh, tuning uh, process. And lastly, they talk about the tune race ANOVA, which is a a little more of an efficient way to tune your hyperparameters rather than trying everything. Uh, it actually looks at the, uh, it runs an ANOVA test, so an F test. I think Daniel's a little more familiar with this, but uh, pretty much eliminates any models that are not necessary. We think this model's bad, it's not worth looking into it anymore. Uh, so let's move on. So that's in essence what this chapter talks about, chapter 13. And is there any more stuff I'm gonna cover before? Yeah, the book used the um, neural net example, but I'm not too familiar with neural net, so I'm just going to use a random forest for my example. Well, any more details before I... Yeah, we can forget about this. All right, let's go to DR Studio. Okay, uh, how's this for Zoom? Is Can everybody see my screen? Like, the lines are clear. Yes. All yeah. right, perfect. Okay, so tight inverse tight models, and I'm gonna do register parallel right away. And I only have two cores, so it might be a little slow. Um, and one thing to note on um, parallel processing, and when you do control verbose is true, like when you wanna print a bunch of stuff, it actually cancels it out when you turn on parallel processing. So it just adds up. Um, so I'll load in my data. Um, looks like this. Your, the outcome is the, uh, so this data set is about uh, different animal shelters and how uh, they end up. So they, get, they either get transferred, they either get adopted or there's no outcome. And they have a bunch of different information on the pets themselves. So pets get an ID, uh, they get their age. Uh, is, it a, is it a cat, dog, whatever? And then a bunch of breed information, color and, and so on, right? So I'm not going to do too, too much uh, um, feature engineering, but I did do like a parse, a parse of age because it gave you like, oh, this cat is two months old. This dog is three weeks old. So I did a little parsing, but I learned in Lubridate, uh, there's a as period function um, that pretty much takes in, uh, I think this will work. Yeah, so that, isn't that cool? Like, it could give you a little string and gives you a little object, uh, a period object that um, parses it for you. So I thought that was pretty nice. So I don't really need to do this. Anyways, so I'll, I'll do the usual shebang. Uh, I'm only going to take 1% of the data because my computer is really slow and can't train too, too much. So it's uh, 544 by 11 uh, data set here. So I'll do the initial split, training testing, that's seed, and then I'm gonna do a five-fold cross-CV. Uh, 
cross validation. So 326 analysis and then 82 uh, evaluation. I know it's a small data set, but that's all my computer can handle. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just go ahead. Uh, I'll skip the EDA. Um, and here's my recipe. I don't do too much, uh, just give it an ID. Uh, do a little month extraction from the date time uh, column. So I just want the month of when they, uh, when they enter the data, data set, get rid of it. And there's a couple of missing values in DH. So I, I imputed the means, uh, normalize every numeric vector, which is just uh, uh, age, and then step novel and unknown. So if we run into like an NA or like a new uh, animal breed or a type, uh, we just say it's an unknown uh, new new uh, level to the factor. Step dummy every single uh, nominal vectors, nominal column, sorry. And then I did a little text uh, um, feature extraction. So um, this is from a text recipes package and basically saying in these like breed color, there's a bunch of information here. So I'm gonna take word by word. So uh, maybe like a short hair and there's a short hair here. So this, uh, this row and this row will get a feature saying, okay, breed includes short hair, something like that, right? So, and then I can use that as a feature on its own as a dummy. So that's pretty much all I did. And then I used term frequency for the text. So that's my recipe. And it looks something like this. So, right, term frequency, breed Australian, bat, color is red, uh, month is June, and so on. It's pretty simple. These are all dummy variables except for the age and the outcome variable. Okay, so that's my recipe. And then let's just tune a random forest. Um, so this pretty, looks pretty similar. Um, uh, my random forest spec is random forest tune these three guys, min and trees and mtri with using the ranger and we're gonna do a classification. Uh, one tip here, if you don't wanna write out every single um, spec, it is, there's a parsnip added. So if I wanna train, let's say random forest from ranger, uh, I don't know, logistic regression, whatever, whatever, whatever. It writes it out for you. Isn't that cool? That's cool. Yeah. And then the book actually talks about the use this package that writes out even the recipe for you. I don't know where I can find it. Maybe it's here. Yeah, but like there's use a use models or use this. Is it use models? I think so. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Yeah, in the use models package, there's a, a couple different helper functions that do the similar things, but they write out the bare minimum recipe for you too, which is um, which is useful, I guess. Um, so yeah, they do the workflow. Sorry, recipe spec, put it into a workflow, and then they tune it. Oh, pretty cool. Uh, just one step, but I. I've never used this. Anyways. Yeah, sorry, just uh, one one question. It might yep. be nit nitpicking, but I think that in the previous chapter, they said that it doesn't really make sense to, to tune the number of trees in a random forest because it should give you like the more trees should give you like numerical stability, but not uh, not not affect the the model. So in the, but it's, I, I guess it's not, not important from the point of, of grid search, just. Yeah, I think the tree, number of trees really come in handy when you're training like a boosting model, right? Like, uh, like an XG boost or add a boost. Um, but yeah, generally more trees, the better. Like you don't want to have like, 10 trees, right? So yeah. I think anywhere above like 500, 800 range would be okay. But I'm going to tune it anyway here today, just okay, for the okay. purpose of yeah, sure. <laughs> showcasing. Um, 
All right, so there's a couple of ways you can approach this. Um, I'm gonna go random for a spec, and then I'm gonna add that to my workflow. Right, so my workflow is this, and if you've seen the model, my specification, of course, my hyperparameters are the tune um, value, which uh, is telling us, okay, I don't know what this is, but we're gonna we're gonna find out uh, by tuning. And one thing to note is m try. M try is the number of variables that we wanna use to uh, make the split in the random forest. And the max value, we don't know that until the models have been finalized. So if we do RF uh, workflow parameters, it's a uh, question mark because we don't know it. And I think that was covered last week. Um, so we have to use a finalized, um, I actually don't know what this does, but um, these functions take a parameter object and modify the unknown parts of our ranges based on a data set, simple heuristics. So I think this looks up the training data that we feed in, uh, where is it? Uh, my recipe, yeah, this training data, and they look up how many columns there are, sorry, the variables there are, and then finalize the max number of that range for you. Um, so if I do and try, does that work? I think it will. Yeah, so the range default range is unknown, so they uh, finalize the unknown before you do anything. Um, does that make sense? Because we don't know, we, we don't know the max number. Okay. So we have the workflow. Uh, sorry, uh, do you have to finalize if you manually set it that let's say the maximum is 10, e even though you have 20 variables, you can set it to a smaller value, right? Yeah, I don't think you have to finalize it if you know how many you're gonna train. So okay. I'll, I'll cover it, but in here, like I don't know how many variables there are, but uh, I'm gonna give it a random value between 10 and 30. I think that's okay, as long as it doesn't go over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to call the Q and grid function here, uh, really similar to the fit resamples that we covered a couple of weeks ago. So you feed it the uh, cross validation folds you're going to get, uh, you can give it a couple metric set. Uh, so I didn't mean log loss this time, but I don't know, you can do like accuracy and, and whatever if you wanted to, but I'm just going to stick to mean uh, log loss. And grid, this is the argument that we're interested in. So I'm going to cover the First, let's do the uh, simplest one. So if we feed in grid as a positive integer, this gets fed into a Latin hyper cube grid. So that's a grid Latin hyper uh, cube. And this is basically a space filling algorithm. Uh, it, if I Google this, Latin, See here, like um, it's a four by four grid, and we're, we want to plug in four uh, values as spread out as possible, and it makes sure in one row and one column there's only one value. So that's what a Latin hypercube is. I didn't really look into it too much, but it's a space filling algorithm, so that points don't overlap in you know, uh, and then you miss like a big chunk of area. So it's making sure everything's covered. So that's the default argument when you or default action when you feed a positive integer it just gets fed into a latin hypercube so let's do that oh this is just going to yell at me when uh this trains so i'm feeding in two different values for all the parameters here by saying two i'm saying Give me two options of m try, give me two options of trees, and give me two options of min n. So if I go, can I do this parameters? I can't. Uh, that's fine. So that's our tuning result. And uh, one way to look at this is a auto plot. Right? So two different values for different m try, uh, m try, trees, and min n. Um, and you can say, give me show best of the tuning result. And here it is, uh, mean log loss of 0 0.6, uh, resulted by m try of 29, uh, 1, 2, 3, 8, and min end of 17. So that was our best model out of all the, uh, I wonder if I can pull it out here. 
styles object. I think I can do this. Why did the show best return two rows? Can I do totals? Or I can do like predictions maybe? No. I guess that's the grid. Uh, hold on, there was a function. I mean, the show best returns the best parameter combination, right? Yeah, I wonder if there's a show best a cutoff argument. Show best, and it's five. Okay, maybe I do show best uh, RF tune, and is four. Does that work? Yeah, there's only two. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. if you put n yeah, equals put one or I think that'll give me four out of four out of ten combinations. Ah, I wonder if there has to be a way to pull the grid out. But I'm blanking out on how to do it. Yeah, so see this here, like creating pre-processing data to finalize unknown parameter try. That's pretty much thing to finalize for you while the model is tuning. Okay, while that's tuning, I don't know, maybe go over some of the concepts. Yeah, the book did a uh, neural net. I understand. Oh, maybe this. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. So that probably works. Yeah, because we gave it 10, right? Yeah. And then if we do a auto plot, this gives you different combinations. One thing I don't like about doing the grid uh, positive integer method is that all points are kind of the same. Like, right, this shows the same similar patterns. But if I do a crossing, like, I, like I'm going to do pretty soon. It gives you a nice little uh, faceted chart, which is really nice. Um, so that was the first method, just giving it a hyper uh, Latin hypercube um, grid, and it's just going to figure it out for you. So I'm going to space out as much space as possible. But if I really wanted to zoom in, uh, let's say I like this combination, 26 M try, 1300 trees, min n is 24. So let's investigate a little. Uh, I'm going to train 200 trees here because my computer is really slow. Uh, let's do 100 and 200. And I want the M try of, let's go really conservative, and 10 to 12. And then I'm going to train. Yeah, whatever. So that's my tuning grid. And I want to train 18 different hyperparameter combinations, right? So because it's a crossing, it's going to give you all the different combinations. Now, if I feed in this table into my tuning argument, grid argument, it's going to take a while. Uh, grid regular. I'll cover this too. But this is basically the same thing. Grid regular, uh, you give it a different uh, positive integer, and then it's going to give, give out a couple different uh, combinations for you. Irregular grid is a Latin hyperparameter. Uh, like Latin hypercube, sorry. And it fills fill a space out nicely where it's not overlapping like this one. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so, do you know what uh, show best does if you specify a multiple metrics? Multiple metric. So, so will it show or compute the best based on the first metric or I think you it's the metric set. Uh, let's try actually. Um, can I can I auto plot this first? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so it gives you a faceted plot because I've fed, fed in 100 trees and 200 trees and different values for min n and m try. 
uh, now I might go, okay, um, in when tree is 100, uh, m try, it looks to be better when it's a little more than 10. And min n seems to be a lot better when it's a lot uh, bigger than 12. So I might go, okay, why don't we increase this 15 to 20? And then I might go uh, 12 to 15. Let that run. But before I do that, let's try, let's try this. And I'll just do two here. I think that work. Yeah, okay. I, I didn't see that that you specified the metric again in show best, not just in the toning part. Yeah, I think this okay, works. Okay. Or if I did mean log loss, that'll work too. That so different uh, seven seven eight four accuracy and six oh five mean log loss. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um yeah, so let's do this. So how many am I training? Too many. Uh, let's do 19. What was that giving me? 16, too many. Let's do 14. Yeah, eight combinations. That's... So remember this here. I'm just going to take a snip real quick. That's why I'm so happy. Okay, I'll, I'll just go back to the plot. Anyways, so I'll tune this here. All right, what do we have here? So 594, which I think was worse than the last time. No, it's better than the last time. So I, I like taking notes down here. Like, uh, so I'll say mean log loss was this in these combinations and I kind of move on to the next level, right? So the best I've come up with has been 649. So I'm kind of beating my own performance here uh, doing live coding, which is exciting. So 0 0.594. And then it was 14, three was 200. So I'm probably overfitting, but that's okay. Yeah, so that's how I approach regular grid. And once you think if you have a good idea, you can just finalize the workflow by saying select best of the tuning result. And it gives you the best uh, best setting, 19214, which we saw here. And I think I can give them a trick. And this is yelling at me because we fed in two different metric sets and it doesn't know which one to use. So it's using the first one. So this is the best hyperparameter setting we've been exploring so far. Uh, so comparing that to the previous tuning results, we had we had this, right? So we saw, uh, we, we thought uh, more m try the better and more min n the better. Was that the case? I think so, because, uh, where is it? M try, uh, only two values, that's okay. So it's focusing on this part here. Min n is 14, and uh, we're comparing 19 m try versus 20 m try, and I see 20 m try is a lot better. So I might investigate further, like maybe, uh, maybe I'll try like this range. I, I won't, but you get the idea, right? Like you get the, um, you see the trend and you kind of zoom into that uh, little zone you think is important and try and uh, uh, fine tune what combinations work best with each other. So, or you can 
manually feed in the hyperparameters that you think is the best, right? This is a simple tibble. Uh, column, column names are the hyperparameters and then the values for their rows. And I can finalize a model with either this or I can go select best or same thing. So you finalize a model which looks like this. And if you look at the specs, now we have the actual values instead of the tune um, expression that we saw earlier uh, in here. Rather than tune, we have the values given by the select best uh, tune results. And uh, you can last fit RF workflow last fit initial split. So what this does is now we have the model we're going to train with the hyperparameters that we think are the best. We're going to use the initial split, which was the um, which contains the training and the testing. And this function takes the training, trains on that training data using the hyperparameters, and then uh, predicts on the testing. Does that make sense? I'm just gonna make sure I, yeah, okay. Yep, so if I last tuned RF, might take a while. Oh no, it didn't. And then it gives you a nice little predictions and you can do a bunch of collect predictions, right? Uh, it gives you the Pred adoption, welcome, blah, blah, blah. And you can do collect metrics to see how you did. So our accuracy was 757 and ROC AUC is 828. And that's how I approach this, uh, the tuning. Any, I'll pause here, any, any comments or questions so far? I was just wondering that these these plots are already a bit complicated with with three parameters that are tuned, so it's kind of hard to like see see which is better. So, do you have a technique when there are more than three parameters that are tuned, or you only use the select best? And so, so what what can you do when? then the plot does not show a clear, clear winner. But it doesn't show a clear pattern. Um, I don't know. Let's try, let's try a little more. Two, 10. One, two, five. It usually shows a pattern. Like that's, if it doesn't, like I, I'm usually stuck. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so. Yeah, I guess it, it should show, but maybe if there are so if there are only four dimensions or more. Yeah, I wonder how, how it trains like an XG boost, for example, where there's like a, a lot of hyperparameters. Um, yeah, I don't know. You'll have to. Actually, there's a pretty useful video on Julia Silgi. Uh, she walks how do how we do early stopping with XGBoost? And I think she does three or four hyperparameters. Uh, where is it? Uh, she only has three. Okay. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've never had to train tune a bunch of parameters. Does did anyone else right. have any opinions? No? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a good question. Leave it in the chat for future purposes. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to this. Um, I have another question. So yeah, 
even the book mentioned like ANOVA to determine if, if the best parameter is, is actually better or to see, see how, or maybe uh, exclude some of the worst parameters. So I wonder if, if here when you like uh, manually zoomed in, shouldn't we like see some confidence intervals or something to to determine whether it's just some random noise or the, the parameters are actually performing better or it's not that big of a problem due to resampling or, or how do you see that? Yeah, that's what I was going to say initially, like resampling, because we're doing cross-validation. There's a little bit of a step to make sure it doesn't memorize everything. Yeah. But I don't know if anyone else any better ideas. Confidence intervals, I'm not sure. Maybe just creating a repeated default would do it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't worry about, about 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 overfitting because resampling should prevent that. Just these these different parameters might might be really close to each other, like they might perform similarly, and that's just maybe a tiny difference. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. Sorry. Oh, but it's okay. I, I was just wondering. Um, yeah, so this tuned. Um, this is generally what you'll see when your computer is more powerful than mine. Uh, you'll see a bunch of different lines going across. So if I'm looking at this, I'll probably say trees 20 is better than 10, right? If you see here, like the log loss or accuracy log loss goes down significantly. Um, and then maybe the M try is better when there's five because the pink line is below than all the rest of the ones consistently across different tree, tree numbers. And I would probably say in this range of min N, there's really no difference in how the model works because they look flat to me. So yeah, I, I don't know if there's other strategies in approaching uh, determining what what what's better than the other, what hyperparameter settings are best than the others. I don't know. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, and then when you're doing like things like this, you probably just want one metric. So I'm, I'm I have accuracy on the first column, first row, and then the. Uh, mean log loss on the second second row. I probably just want one of these because um, it's a little confusing. But yeah, uh, what else do I have? So that was it. And then I do another example with a multinomial uh, logistic classification, which is basically the same thing. And oh, one thing I can do is show the hyper like Latin hypercube. So. This is just a random, uh, not random. Um, this is a logistic regression with multiple outcomes. And if I use the grid Latin hypercube function itself, I can feed in the tuning parameters, penalty mixture, and give them the range. And I give it the size that I want. So what this does is gives me a hundred different combinations that fills in the space effectively. Or if I do, uh, maybe I'll do this. Uh, ggplot penalty mixture and so hold on. okay and if I did 10 here it just gives me this Whereas if I did grid regular, can I do grid regular here? Ah, no, okay. Grid random. This, this is gonna be overlapping, right? So if I do 100 random uh, grid, a lot of overlaps, a lot of overlaps, let's do 1,000. Yeah, it kind of kind of like concentrated on the left side. You don't really want that, right? Whereas if you do grid Latin hypercube, 
Um, it fills it out nice. Ah, okay. All right. I thought it wouldn't. Pure chance. It'd be different. Is not there a log scale somewhere, and that's the reason why it? Oh, there's more on the left side. Maybe, because uh, uh, penalty I think should be is in log, right? Yeah. And this is what Daniel talked about last week with grid. Sorry, factor regularization. I think Frederick had brought that up too. Uh, I think so. Uh, maybe. Um, what? Pull dials object, maybe? Yeah, this yeah, is says, this is logged. Uh, how do we do this again? Uh, there was an option, right? That Daniel covered. Not here. Is it a my chapter? What would you like to achieve? I want to see if I can turn this into uh, just do a log scale. Uh, scale x log 10. Yeah, OK. So, okay, that's a little more spaced out. Then, grid random. Yeah, okay. Do they look different to you guys? Maybe. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So this is supposed to be overlapping. Too many. I do 10. Uh, or okay, that's a little that's a little cluster, right? Cluster, yeah. cluster. And if I do Latin, it's spaced out, I think. Oh yeah, that's the idea. But behind uh, uh, random versus regular versus irregular grid, you you just don't want uh, hyperparameter settings to overlap with each other. Um, oh, very interesting. Thank you. Just, sorry. Um, if you um, if you like to conclude and say, for example, what what these um, other parameters uh, um, are and how would they influence your model, um, how would you change them, uh, and why would you choose those parameters uh, instead of the others? So just if you go back to your data your original data and then you now have this conclusion and say i found these other parameters how would i um, in practice make a conclusion to use them and decide which one of them would be use them over the other the, combination yes. of parameters right i do the show best i i look at whatever metric i'm interested in so in this case mean log loss and i say M try 527 uh, is significantly better than 525, for example, because of uh, we're just looking at pure log loss and this is a lot better. That's how I would approach this. Interpret right. this, sorry. So right. I'm not going to use this because it's worse. That's okay. worse than the best one. So, but if I think I go back to the uh, original data and say, I've made this model, which um, uh, has given me um, like predictions of the, of the different 
combination of my original data. And now, what I have found, I found a metric uh, which give me give me uh, a mean of this metric. So because I've like processed a certain number of of um, predictions, so I have uh, made a certain number of um, com different combinations of my data. And now I found this, uh, which is the best. How, so now, what? Yeah, the, the no, what, what? What would you say? Um, thinking about your original data, so like the dogs and everything. When you What's, say data, is that my training or is that my testing? Yeah, the training on the testing is exactly the same. You know, you just split the data. Yeah, but I'm not going to touch my training set or sorry, testing set until the very end though. Like I'm not going to go back because I fit my testing set better to my model. Okay. So data maybe, leakage. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to do things else. So. Um, okay. Uh, that, now that you have found this best, what do you do? I finalized my workflow using the finalized workflow uh, function with these hyperparameters that I think are the best, or I can give my own. So in your case, if you found somehow a better combination of min and trees and mtry, maybe that's three, maybe this is one, this is two, you, you can plug in your own combinations uh, as a table rather than going through the whole tuning process. And I can sub this out, select best from my tuning results with your own, my, my, my best guess. And then this gives you your, your hyperparameters that you, you think are the best. And then you tr last fit using the split. So you using these hyperparameters, you train the model with the training and then test it on the testing set and do whatever you want with it. Is that, does that answer your question? Um, at, let, let, uh, I'll be that back. Basically, you have found a tree, which is a, the best combination of your data. Um, with these upper parameters, which is the M try and the mean. And then you apply this to uh, your initial split to see how this combination that you have uh, basically created with your recipe and everything, how it works within your data. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I kind of have a question too. So when yeah. working with this and let's say, you know, you train your model and you do everything and then you present, would you, how would you explain to them or explain to somebody, this is the process I went to determine my metrics versus, you know, me randomly doing it? Like, how do you, instead of pulling this up and, you know, I did a grid search, I did this, I used that. Is there like a simple way to explain that? How do I explain like what I did, I guess? Yeah, your process to come up with the metrics instead of saying, you know, I decided to do them, you know, I just picked some random numbers. Do you have yeah, experience I don't know. in that? Or, I would. Or, or would you say? Yeah, I would know, start I with this? the hyper hyper cube because it fills out, the, it takes the default ranges um, and then just trying to fill it out. So you're trying every possible combination in a reduced volume. And then you say, hey, this I think is my, I think is where the area is. Like this is a sweet spot. And I zoomed into it. I, I don't know if there's a way to, uh, off the top of my head anyway, to concretely say this is the best combination. Uh, does anyone else have any ideas? I think I, I think it's for me it's less about finding the the right one, just finding you know, explaining it into in a way that you know the whoever's viewing or whoever you're presenting to kind of have a logical understanding of. I'm not just in here plugging in random numbers. Okay. I'm in here doing a process that's, you know, robust and trying my best. And how do you explain that without going into super detail on like, oh, all these other functions or this or that, if you're presenting to like your boss okay. or something. 
maybe you can, uh, maybe the logistic regression comes in handy because penalty, like you can say, I use the low penalty because I didn't want any feature, uh, uh, select automatic feature selection due to L1 regularization. Say, uh, I didn't want that. So I use a certain combination of penalty and mixture. Uh, maybe you can explain the meanings behind the hyperparameters rather than just blindly saying these are the best combinations. Explain your thoughts behind why you selected those hyperparameters. That's just an idea. Like, I don't know if that's the best way. Okay. But with certain hyperparameters, you can explain, like, uh, um, yeah, like a penalty using different regularization or an XG boost saying, like, uh, I want to stop iteration. Uh, I want to do early stopping because I thought uh, uh, it's better, best not to use the models that didn't matter too much. I would go into the meanings of the hyperparameters if, if I'm asked that question, like why it makes sense. That's the best option. I think even in random force, like you, you can say, uh, I did M try of two. Like I only used two columns, two variables to split my nodes because I thought uh, doing more would result in noise or something. And I, I wanted to go as granular as possible uh, uh, where my final leaf is only a sample of three rather than uh, a more broad, bigger number of final uh, leaf size. I don't know, that's how I, I would do it. Okay, um, that's the that's about the live coding I wanted to cover, and then just cover the the, uh, the book a little bit. Uh, what else did they have? Parallel processing, so you can sample over parallel over resamples or everything, and this is a little more computationally expensive because it parallels over or it repeats the uh, recipe creation process as well. Um, and they have a nice little plot, um, so everything is uh, significantly. Uh, uh, more time consuming when your models are more expensive than, than cheap. Uh, racing methods. Uh, this is a nice GIF, I thought. Uh, so you have a bunch of processors working on different models and you eliminate them as you think they're, uh, they're not good. Eliminate, eliminate, and then you end up with this one. Uh, am I correct to assume that this racing would make sense if there are like a lot more folds? So for five folds, like you don't have much, much data to determine or stop early because I, if, if I understand correctly, this, this racing is good because if you, I don't know, you trained your model on half of the uh, folds and you see that it's bad then you don't have to train it on the other folds but if you yeah. uh, if, if you if you only have like five folds then it's not that useful but if, if you have 50 then it will be much more useful yeah i think this is a lot more useful in uh boosting sense where your where your model output depends on the previous one so we kind of build on top of models, see if, okay, this model was not that important, but uh, boosting just kind of goes on anyway. So if you wanted to eliminate that uh, shitty model, like you just eliminate it from the get-go and don't go ahead with them. And I think this does a really, Julia does a really good job explaining this. I'll post it on uh, the chat. Yeah, so maybe not in a sense, you know, you probably wouldn't want to, where is it? Do a racing model on like a logistic regression because you're gonna have to train them anyway. But if your model depends on the previous one, I think this will be a good time saver. Okay. And then here's how you do it. Pretty, looks pretty similar. You feed it a grid, metrics, and control. And, and yeah, I think that's it. Uh, chapter summary, we covered this regular grid, irregular grid, uh, uh, space filling designs like uh, Latin hypercube. Uh, you can build a bunch of grids using either a positive integer as a grid argument or your own grids. Uh, use tune grid to uh, tune everything. Use the auto plot show best helper functions to uh, interpret your models and decide where you want to go with your models. I didn't cover this uh, fast sub, sub model optimization because I didn't really understand. 
uh, and then you finalize your model using either the best tune result or your own combinations, uh, and then use the last fit function to uh, create a final fit, um, do a little parallel processing uh, to speed up your processes, different workers working on different models at the same time, and maybe a racing method if you're, uh, uh, if you're interested in eliminating some of the bad ones. Grid search is computationally expensive, but thoughtful choices in the experimental design can make them tractable. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have for you guys. Thanks a lot. That was great.